Well, we're here, <laughs> and we've already been introduced. But yeah, so, so we've got slides on that. Yes, this is me. And um, yeah, this, this is you. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> yeah, do you want to tell anyone? No, yeah, I didn't know that. No. It's all boring. <laughs> What's more important is this one. People don't re always realize this, but there's actually four of us that run Yoast. Um, Omar's here in front. So if you want to bug people about things in, at Yoast, Omar's a better person to bug than me. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, we're, we're on it. So Michiel, who's not here, but he, he's watching us. So hi, Michiel. <laughs> and Michiel is, uh, and I uh, do the light side of Yoast, which means it's marketing, Yoast Academy, all the projects, all the yeah, stuff. Yeah, which makes me and Omar the dark side. Yes. That and sort of works if you know us. Yeah, and sometimes people <laughs> cross over. They do that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's not what we're here for, though. No, um, we're, we're here to talk. But usually, we talk about SEO. And uh, we're not going to do that today. So we're going to have a talk, which is kind of a business talk or a community talk, talk about open source, talk about how WordPress changed my life, all of that in one talk. It's going to be great. So <laughs> it's basically a talk about why we love open source. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about why we love it so much uh, to start with just now. And then we'll also show that it's totally able, it's totally true that you can also make money with an open source project. So we'll show you how we make money, but also some examples from, from other companies and other stories. But it's not all about making money, because if you take the making money part too far, it will backfire. So we'll tell you a little bit about that as well. But to start, why do we believe in open source? So <clears throat> there are actually three reasons why we think open source is so very great. And the first reason is that, that we believe that open source is the way to new knowledge and new solutions. I actually think it's the best way or the only way. Two heads are always better than one. The knowledge of two people or more people combined will always exceed the knowledge of just one person. And if people, especially people from different backgrounds, from different companies, work together and cooperate on one project, that project will benefit. So in short, if we stand on each other's shoulders, we become giants and we should take advantage of each other's merits and talents. And the second reason why we believe in open source is because all the other, all the other uh, ideas are just more wasteful. So if you look at a website of a hospital or of a school, there are millions of websites, and they're basically all the same. I totally get that a website needs a distinct design to make it look differently, but the functionality is pretty much the same. So everywhere around the world, Developers are working and making projects that are basically the same. That's totally wasteful. We should not invent the wheel over and over again. And with WordPress, we have a wheel and we iterate on that wheel. That's just great. That's why we love it. And the last, or the third reason why we love open source so much is because it's an equalizer. In a project like in WordPress, everybody can participate. It doesn't matter where you live doesn't matter what you come from, doesn't matter what gender you have. Everybody can help, everybody can pitch in. It's very inclusive. It offers chances to everybody. Whether, whether you have programming skills, or you love translating, or you have organizational skills, everybody can contribute. And now, it's up to you because it's about money. <laughs> so, for lots of people, open source is synonymous to free. That doesn't have to be true, but it is true for a lot of things. So WordPress is open source and it's free, and a lot of open source projects are also free software projects, but that doesn't mean that companies creating that software cannot be profitable companies. Open source does also not have to mean non-profit. There can be a lot of discussion about how you do all these things. But I'm going to show you, by showing you about the growth of a company I know fairly well, how open source can be profitable. So I started my own company in 2010. This was my office. It's not very glamorous. 
I can tell you that on the left of that picture, if I had zoomed out a bit more, you would have seen the washing machine. <laughs> um, this was our attic. Uh, it was just me doing consulting. On the side, I had this hobby project called WordPress SEO that I really did as a hobby up until like 2012. At which point, my lovely wife, who always says that I'm the one talking about money, <laughs> said to me, this is no longer sustainable. We had, or I had, a million users, a shit ton of email, <laughs> and forum support requests and everything. And I was handling them on my own. Because I thought that that thing had to be free completely. And that just doesn't scale. So we started doing things slightly differently. And we created WordPress SEO Premium, now known as Yoast SEO Premium. And the company has grown a bit since. This was our team last year at YoastCon. And if you think this is a lot of people, we added another 30 this year. So I'm, I mean, that group creeps on growing. So I started in 2010. I was on my own. Somewhere in 2012, I saw the light. And we started hiring people. This is the, all the current employees at Yoast by start year. To be fair, we've only ha ever hired seven more that have left us. Two of them have returned. <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty good to be at Yoast, apparently. Um, there's now 80 of us in the Netherlands and 20 more across the world in our support team and a couple of very notable developers. So what we've seen is that freemium is a very good model for software. A freemium product like Yoast SEO, where you have a free base that everybody gets to use, and a premium model that allows people that want to do things faster, or, or that's what we choose, choose for, but that want to do extra things in the premium plugin. But as soon as you start doing that, you run into all sorts of problems. You see, we had this vision of Yoast, and that was SEO for everyone. That's distinctly different from SEO for everyone who can afford Yoast SEO Premium. So when we do major features that we think are important for the web, and yeah, we do think a bit like Morton, we put them in our free plugin. A couple of years ago, we, uh, we released our readability analysis, which was a lot of work. And we put it in our free plugin with no counterparts in the premium plugin. The premium plugin has all that, but it's exactly the same as far as the readability stuff goes because we think it's that important. If you're going to need it to optimize your website, it should be accessible to everyone. That's probably not the most profitable decision we ever made. But at the same time, keeping true to those thoughts has helped us grow tremendously to the point where we're now a 10 million US or euros real currency um, <laughs> a year company. This is no longer about this is no longer about small companies. And this number doesn't really matter. But it does matter that we all realize that we're no longer just small amateurs doing small things for tiny portions of the web. WordPress is 32.5% of the web. We're in the ridiculous stage where we ourselves see stats where we're like 4 or 5% of that 10 million, and you go like, ouch, that's a lot. It makes releasing a whole lot harder, uh, which is why I ha sometimes have my opinions about that. But we're not alone. There are very different models in open source that work as well. I want to highlight a couple just to show that it doesn't have to be like this. Elastic is fun to mention because they, like us, are Dutch. Um, they IPO'd earlier this year. They're now worth around $4 billion on the stock market. 
And if you read their prospectus, you would have seen that as of July 31st, 2018, they had five and a half thousand customers. So how you get to a valuation of four billion at five and a half thousand customers is completely beyond me. But that's what the stock market does. At the same time, they have very high value customers, we're one of them, that pay a whole lot more than people pay for their plugins. It's a very different model where people make money on the high end. It's basically the same as what Acquia in the Drupal community does. They make money on the very high end of Drupal sites. There's another example, Magento. Also got sold this year for the meager sum of 1.7 billion US dollars. That's billion with a B. They make money by doing two things. They have their platform as a surface and they sell an, a premium version of Magento. If you've ever tried to install it, it's slightly more difficult than WordPress. <laughs> and I would seriously suggest if you're doing e-commerce to look elsewhere, but at the same time, it's a very pro a profitable, well-run company. I think the most exciting of all of them is Red Hat, a company that really only system administrators know really well because they make a ton of software that people use to power those servers that we all use every day. They're very interesting because they have bought software companies and open sourced the software that they bought and made more money from it than the company did before. And they've not done that once, but they've done that multiple times. Day two got sold this year. This is how I got to my list. For the meager sum of $34 billion to IBM. A couple of years ago, there was serious doubt about as to whether open source companies could be profitable and could have very high valuation. There was a lot of shade being thrown over Automatic's valuation at some point. If you look at these numbers now, it's not that weird. But as Marika said earlier, this is all about the money. And it is not all about the money. Hi. So a few years ago, actually, on the first WordCamp Europe in Leiden, Joost did, did a talk about, and it was called The Victory of the Commons. And I'm going to do a short piece of that again, because, because you didn't do it entirely correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so sorry. You see what I have to put up with. <laughs> <laughs> so the tragedy of, a co of the commons is a theory, a concept, and it was uh, invented by uh, Eleanor Ostrom, who is an uh, amazing economist and sociologist. And the theory described how a group of people acts when they share something, a common pool of resources. And I think that story or the theory is very applicable to our WordPress ecosystem. So let me explain the tragedy of the commons. It's, imagine a meadow, you can see a meadow with, with little sheep. Yeah, that meadow isn't owned by anybody. It's owned by a community of shepherds or farmers. And um, they can put sheep on their meadow. And the sheep can eat the grass, and they can play and do their thing on the meadow, and just be happy. So there's a community of shepherds. And it's important to understand that every shepherd can put a sheep on the meadow, and the sheep will grow, and it will give wool, and lambs, and meat, and this other stuff. And all the benefits from the sheep will be for the shepherd himself. And this is a bit like the open source project we have. WordPress is our meadow. And we all reap benefits from WordPress. So our company by selling plugins. Um, maybe agencies by building websites with this amazing CMS. What happens in this beautiful meadow is that every shepherd is motivated to add more animals. Because more animals in the meadow will mean more profits for him individually. But an extra animal will also come with a cost. The meadow will face an extra sheep too, and will there be enough grass to eat? And because the meadow isn't owned by anybody, the costs of an extra animal will be for the entire community, while the gains will be for the individual. And here lies the tragedy of the commons of the meadow, says Eleanor Ostrom. 
So if every shepherd is focusing on his or her individual game, they will put more and more sheep on that meadow. And the meadow will get too crowded. This will lead to overgrazing, and the meadow will become less and less productive. And if the shepherds will keep on thinking about themselves, this will continue. And if people only think about their own gain, they will keep doing that, because everybody else is doing it anyway. So it's better to have like a really small, unhealthy sheep than no sheep at all. So in the end, this will lead to a tragedy. The meadow will get ruined. It's such a tragedy. So Eleanor Ostrom uses this example to show how common good projects can go wrong. And I want to reassure you, I don't think that, that, that WordPress is going this way. I think WordPress is flourishing. But it does demonstrate that thinking of only of your own interests could lead to really damaging an open source ecosystem. And that's because of the free rider problem. I think most of you have heard about this. So if people only think about their own interests, common pool resources tend to get ruined. Free riders, a few re free riders is never a big problem, but if everybody would think that way, then a project will get ruined. So this is Adam Smith. He's the, one of the founders of modern economics. And he said for quite a while, and people still believe him, that if every individual does what's best for him, then the outcome would be the best for everybody. So if everybody would just do what's best for him, then we'll have an optimal situation. Well, Eleanor Ostrom already showed Adam Smith was wrong. And then this other guy, this, this, this really awesome guy, he, um, he also showed it mathematically. So this is John Nash, and if you've seen the movie A Beautiful Mind, you will uh, uh, know whom I'm talking about, and otherwise you should watch that movie. Mm -hmm. So according to John Nash, the optimal result will come when people do what's best for them and what best, what's best for the group. So the total optimal results will only come when you do what think of yourself and of the group. So a shepherd should think of their own gain and of the gain for the entire meadow. Applying that to the WordPress community would mean that you should invest in open source software as well, so in, in WordPress core or in WordCamps or stuff, as well as in your individual game. Because in our case, when Yoast was just doing his plugins in the attic and making very little money. He, well, he, he couldn't cope with it. You can't cope with a one million users all by yourself. It was really sad. <laughs> yeah, you, you were sad at some, some points. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, be, because you can't answer all these questions. You can't do that. And when we were making money, the, the, the project became better and everything became better. So that's the, that's the point I want to make. So John Nash mathematically proved this pretty early on in his career, that, and that, that this, this could be calculated. So he calculated an equilibrium, the Nash equilibrium. So the optimal results will appear when harvesting your meadow and reaping the fruits is in the right proportion. And I think now you're up. So, I'm not able to calculate a Nash equilibrium for WordPress. If someone else here is, I would like to see it, but my math skills are pretty limited. But Matt once spoke about 5% for the future, and I think more than once, but he, he's spoken about this idea of companies spending 5% of their resources to improve WordPress. We think that's a great idea, and we've been doing that for quite a while. Um, if everybody did that, and that includes everybody who makes money from the WordPress project, every host, every, um, every agency, etc., there would be a few more of us in those weekly dev chats. So we do a lot of this. Um, we, we put at least 5% of our developer time on on WordPress core. I have to admit, in the last year, we had this small project that a few more people of our team worked on. So in the last year, it's been about 10 to 15% of our total uh, developer resources that worked on Gutenberg. Um, 
But we also had other people working on other stuff that we think is important for the global project. So if you've heard about Surf Happy, yeah, the people involved in that are most, mostly sponsored by us. There are a lot of other things happening, like uh, fixes on the forums by Sergey, and a whole lot of specific things that we think need to happen to keep that meadow green and all those gates in order, etc. But that's just developer time. And one of the things that is so clear is that there's more than development. We sponsor a lot of word camps, and uh, we speak at them. We organize them. There's a couple of people here in front who spend too, many, too much time at word camps. Um, that's all giving back to the community as well, and even that is very limited to this group. I get excited even more when we look at our local projects, when Taco is teaching young kids to build their first WordPress site in our town or when Omar spends every Friday morning helping unemployed people to teach them how to build a, we a website in WordPress and how to do SEO so they get a better chance at employment. That is growing our, our pie and making WordPress truly bigger. But, and there's a common theme in the two talks this morning, <laughs> we all want to keep WordPress healthy. This means that if we need to help, even if that does not directly benefit our company. Sometimes you have to put aside your egos, which in my case is a fairly hard task. Um, <laughs> but we need to think about what's good for WordPress and what's good for our individual companies. And it's really okay to think about that last thing too. There's nothing wrong with thinking about yourself, but you have to think about both. In order to keep that meadow healthy, we all need to give back. And aside from giving back, we need to come up with some ground rules. If one of, one of us is fixing the fence on the one end, it's not really cool if someone else is opening the gate on the other end. If someone wants to give some extra water here, while someone else is doing nutrition there, that might go wrong. A lot of these things need some work. And I'll give you a very concrete example. I and we as a team were not really Gutenberg fanboys from the start. The thing is, we heard about it in June 2017, and we were like, that has some rather big implications for a plugin. It more or less meant redoing half of our code, which if you have ever looked at our code base, you can imagine is a tiny bit of work. But after the initial like descent, we decided, okay, we're gonna step in and we're gonna try and do this. And we figured out, hey, we need to help make Gutenberg better because we can't really do what we want to do yet. So we started adding APIs to Gutenberg to make it extensible for plugin authors and, and make it better. That part is fine. The problem lies in the fact that we heard about it in June 2017, and I read last week in Matt's blog post that they started developing in January 2017. So what happened in those six months? Why did we find out so late? And how could our community communication be so poor that people were developing on a project on the one hand, and we were building stuff that we literally had to throw away on the other hand, and we didn't know? So we need to get better at that. We were literally burning some of our 5% time in those months because we were doing the wrong things. So uh, the biggest problem here is probably communication. <laughs> so we, we want to prevent this tragedy. And actually, Eleanor Ostrom's solution to the tragedy of the commons was communication. 
just get some rules, just get those shepherds to understand that it's important to, to nourish their meadow. And I think we need to do the same thing. And otherwise, the three reasons I, I started with, why open source is so very, very important or very, very awesome, they will be jeopardized. Because if we're not cooperating, then we're not standing on each other's shoulders. Then we're doing things their own way. And we will not come up with those great innovations. We need to communicate in order to come up with those great innovations and new, new knowledge and solutions. And if we're not communicating, it's really, really wasteful. So I see someone painting the fence on one hand and then someone else building an entire new fence and just putting it on that meadow. And then all the painting has been done for nothing. And we as a group have become so very big that it's very hard to communicate with each other. And we don't know what we're all doing. And I do not have the solution for that. <laughs> I, just, I just think that we need to think about how to make sure that people are doing things that are going in the same direction instead of opposite. Because I know everybody is doing their best. And it's such a waste of energy if you're doing something that's not useful in a month or so. And also, if we're not communicating, then not everybody can participate. Because then only the people who come up with a really beautiful new fence get their way. And that shouldn't be the, the thing. It should be an equalizer. Everybody should be able to pitch in. That's the beauty of open source. Th that's what I wanted to say. No, you, you want to say something, I'm sure. I, I do. <laughs> So we're all in this together. It's more true in this project than in a whole lot of other things. Uh, but I think our communication needs to level up. And we need a roadmap and a plan of where are we going. And not just a development roadmap, but a wider thing. So we own this meadow together. And if we want to grow it, and our companies, and everything that's related to it, we need to lead this together too. I was very happy to see what got us here won't get us there on Morton's slides. I agree. And it doesn't apply just to code. It applies to everything in this project. So let's get that discussion started. Thank you. Folks, we have time for some questions. If you have a question, we have two microphones set up on either side of the room here in the aisles. Please come up and ask those questions so our live stream viewers can hear you. Uh, or if you need me to bring the mic to you, please raise your hand and I will bring it over. Hi, um, I'm Christina. I am both a small business owner and on the organizing team for this campus, or WordCamp US, Thank which you. has been a lot of work and <laughs> more than my personal 5%, perhaps. <laughs> and I, kind of my thoughts are around how much we ask of each other when we're all coming from very different places. And I think it's interesting like to hear Morton say, we need to do more. And then you're like, oh, we all need to do more. And I'm like, oh my god, I've done so much. <laughs> and I'm a small business owner, and I don't have the backing of a other company or whatever. And then in my life as well, I, I promise this as a question. Um, I also am involved in, in the Wikimedia, Wikipedia world, which is another very big global community. We're all nerds in many ways. And they have a lot of thoughts about all of this governance and stuff, and I, but I never hear any of the WordPress people thinking, talking about how Wikipedia does it or the way um, users, like the barrier to entry is so much different in the Wikipedia world than it is in the um, WordPress world where you maybe have to understand Slack or complicated dev things or um, this whole community that is confusing and foreign. So I guess my question is, I heard a lot of things about like the people making money but how do we live in a world when a lot of us know that this will never be profitable for us? Um, how do we still give without driving ourselves crazy and draining all of our resources? Where, what does the common say about that? Yeah. I, th I think for, for 
for this audience, we're preaching for the wrong, <laughs> wrong audience <laughs> because you're already doing your 5%. And I think if, if you're not making money out of WordPress, the only thing you can give is time. And that's it. But there are a lot of companies who are making a lot of money and they should be giving back 5% money-wise, I guess. And also, I, I think it's up to the WordPress project to make sure that if you're giving that much more than the 5% that you actually have to give, or have to give, but that, but what, what you can do meaningfully without hurting your own business. I think the project as, as a whole could do more to reward you for what you're doing and make sure that you get new business out of this or whatever we could do to, to highlight people that are doing this, uh, this stuff. Because I, I, then it becomes mutually beneficial and we can all benefit from this. So I know that uh, Joseph has been working on a 5% project for like a, a while. Uh, and and okay. <laughs> uh, but it, so there's, we have to find that that equilibrium a bit more. And I can totally understand that uh, organizing a WordCamp like this is draining. Yeah. I mean, we had two people on the WordCamp Europe organizing team last year, and if I look at the hours, I go like, dude, I don't really look at the hours, but. <laughs> But it's like, like dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of time. It's a large investment, even for us. So I can totally imagine that it's, uh, it's an, a large investment if you're an individual. But thank you. Hey, I'm, I'm Jake. I'm the founder of 10UP. Um, I have a, I'd like to hear more from you about the intersection between governance and commercialized solutions, because I think one of the things that's unique about our open source community, I think wonderful about our open source community in many ways, and that it spawns amazing companies like your own, is that we have a number of what I would describe as almost canonical solutions at this point for problems that I would say are pretty critical to the mass audience of WordPress, the solutions that arguably maybe at some point should even be in core, be a part of, for other CMSs, be a part of that core platform. Not just SEO, which I think is germane to you, but forms, calendars, events, a lot of solutions that take on uh, massive scale. Uh, there's, there's a lot of features in that plugin that should be in core. 100%. <laughs> so like, I guess my question is, when you think about governance and you think about entities that are outside the core open source project in many ways in their own commercial entities, is there a role for govern governance in major solutions that a massive part of the community adapts and become almost critical to 50% of the use cases of the platform? I. Well, yeah, but I think they've already admitted to that in a bit. We This week, they, uh, we started on end-to-end -end tests for Gutenberg that uh, activate some of the largest plugins uh, and, and run some tests to make sure that we didn't break anything in that. Um, I, I think that's, I mean, this is an, incre an incredibly big ecosystem that, I don't, ha like, just like Marika said, I don't have the solution to this. It's a very hard problem in many ways, but to a certain extent, we have a, 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 a mutual responsibility to make sure that we keep stuff working. And we've always done that with our backwards compatibility ideas. And with Gutenberg, we've done away with some of that, but not really even all that much. I think in, in the end, We've, we've reached a pretty good state of where backwards compatibility is achieved and people can still keep on running things and all the large plugins sort of work. And some better than others because some work with Gutenberg and others work in spite of Gutenberg. But, I, well, I think it's a mutual responsibility and I, I think the core team is quite aware that they, if they break a big plugin, they're gonna get as much whining as when they break something in core itself that not a whole a lot of people use. Thanks. Hi, this is a question about profitability and open source and specifically the freemium model. So it seems to me that the freemium model is based on a trust in the community that in giving some of your work away, they will see that value and repay it. Um, but I also notice a pattern that most companies that operate on a freemium model open source portions of their code, and then other portions are kept in private repositories. Uh, is that a sign to you that, that trust has its limits? Is that an example of like that Nash equilibrium looking out for yourself while also giving back? And is that the right move? It's, it's hard. So some of our uh, premium repositories are open, some are closed. I can't really find a difference 
in the two in, in terms of how profitable they are or whatever. So I think that some of our, in the end, we will probably end up opening up most of our repositories because I think that's the easiest thing to do because even to our premium plugin, people want to do pull requests and I'm fine with people giving code. Um, but what you, it too, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, what is happening a bit more and more, uh, a bit more at the moment is that you see companies move to a SaaS model for for their premium offerings. We've recently done that. Jetpack has always done that. Uh, so there, there's more and more companies that are moving slowly in that direction because it's a li little easier to control, and the trust factor doesn't become as mi as big of a problem. Um, there's no easy solutions in that game. Uh, it's it's pretty hard to to do right and to fi to figure out a a good equilibrium that works for your company. And for us, I mean, it's 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 gotten us a lot of growth. Uh, and at times, it's even hard to look at. Okay, so we want to do five percent. We've grown this much. That means that we need to do this much more in the next year. Uh, you saw that in Matt's recent post as well. Like he was saying that we'd add some, they'd add some more committers or, or developers because. Automatic has grown. I think that's a good thing. It's over time these things work out, and everybody has to come up with their own set of how do we do this and how does this work. And maybe over time we can even collaborate on some of that between some of these companies. Thank you. Hi, Mariek. Hi, Yost. Thanks for a good talk. Uh, it's pretty inspiring. Uh, the WordPress project has suffered uh, traditionally from a bit of a bottleneck. Uh, with contributors because of this kind of tiny team of committers who uh, have to deal with all of the contributions of WordPress. Um, how, can the, how can the project and the community uh, go about deciding on a government's model that kind of gets rid of this bottleneck, you know, this, this, this dependency on a few small people who, oh, sorry, a small group of people who can... <laughs> They're, all, can, they're, they're uh, all pretty small, too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, apart from your Dutch guys. Yeah. Um, how, how can the community kind of uh, figure out a, a good governance model to reduce this, this problem of a, a bottleneck? Yeah, you do that. <laughs> so, to be honest, I don't think the bottleneck of the WordPress community right now is developers. I think the bottleneck lies in the project management layer just above that. Um, and, well, that needs work. Uh, it needs a bit more of a, as I said, a roadmap. It needs, it needs a bit more of an idea of where we're going that is laid out in, in proper like, posts or pages on WordPress.org where I can see what we're going in and what the direction is and what we're, what we're going to build and what makes sense to work on and what doesn't make sense to work on. Because right now we let everybody work on whatever they want, which is, I think, to a certain extent, fine. But we're not always going to merge everything that everybody's doing. So we need to come up with a better um, way of managing that and a better way of managing the expectations around it. And I don't really think that the number of developers is even the problem. I think that the problem is that we we have this layer of developers that have commit rights. But there's no like architectural decisions being made in some group that then everybody works on. It just sort of happens. Mm. And I would like us to, to have a bit more of architectural like leads and go to a model where, where there's an architectural board that decides we're going to build it like this. And then another group of people probably should decide on what it is that we're going to build. But these are distinct, different things where you, you decide on what you're going to build and how you're going to build it. And in every company in the world, these, these things are separated entities. And I wouldn't mind WordPress being run a bit more like a global company. Uh, but I mean, that's my, my view at it. At the same time, I, I think we just need to have that discussion with everybody involved and see like where do we end up? Going to do that in January. <laughs> Apparently, we're going to do that in January, but I'm I'm open just starting today. Great. <laughs> Thanks. All right, folks, we have time for either one more long question or two really quick ones. So we'll start right over there. <laughs> I've been pressured. Um, I hope um, it was quick. <laughs> hi, my name is Toru Miki. I came from Tokyo. I gave a talk yesterday. Um, my question 
is that you mentioned better communication is needed. Could you possibly elaborate a bit more on that? Because um, does it do you mean as simply more number of conversations or different way of visualizing the, the, the discussion that has been made or the summaries of made or and I also this ask this because um, I from Japan, you're from Holland, and the, I think you know the way people think um, when you get asked about more better communication. They people tend to interpret a little differently. So it, the way you communicate, what they think better communication is different from the culture to regions. And Absolutely, yeah. I'm. Well, the whole the dog um, development is done in English, which I, you know, I personally have no complaints about it or anything. But since not 100% of WordPress users is English language, I think it's about 50, 40, something like, something like that, I think. Um, is there something to fill that gap in some way or another? You're making it even harder now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah, you're totally right. That, that, that's a cultural thing as well. I don't know. It is. I, I, I can elaborate a lot more, but let's do that off stage. But uh, I, I do think that, in essence, it means that we have a, um, a vision of where we want to go that is slightly more than a vision, but has like, OK, so these are the things that we're going to build, and th this is the plan for the coming year or, or year or two. Mm -hmm. That is slightly better laid out than it has been for the last year. The problem was with Gutenberg that there was a lot of thinking like that, but it wasn't on paper and it was very hard for people to find out what the goal was. And I think that if we had gotten that a lot earlier, it, it would have been a lot easier for a lot of people to see, hey, this is actually very cool and we need to step in on this. Maybe democratizing publishing is a bit too broad <laughs> to work on. Yeah, so so th I think that that's the the biggest. Thing. It needs to go from okay. So this is our vision. This is what that looks like in our vision. Let's discuss those steps, and then let's go from there. <laughs> Thank you. Aww. Thank you. Sorry, I realized it was the wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. That's all the time we have today, folks. Please give our speakers one more round of applause. <laughs>